Now that we have seen how amino acid structures and charges can change based on the pH of the solution they're in, we're going to talk about some different techniques that can be used to separate them from one another. We can take advantage of two characteristics as we try and separate amino acids, namely differences in charge and differences in the polarity of their R groups. Charge differences are affected by pH, as we learned earlier. Increasing pH, in general, tends to deprotonate functional groups and make the net charge on an amino acid more negative. On the other hand, decreasing pH tends to protonate functional groups and make the net charge more positive. R group polarity can be exploited when separating amino acids as well, as the polarity of the R group determines whether a given amino acid will be soluble or insoluble in a given solvent. Hopefully you remember the saying, like dissolves like, from chemistry, meaning that polar amino acids will dissolve in polar solvents and nonpolar amino acids will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. A polar amino acid will not be very soluble in a nonpolar solvent, and vice versa. Chromatography is the technique used to separate amino acids, and there are two types that we will focus on. One is thin layer chromatography, or TLC, and the other is ion exchange chromatography, or IEC. Thin layer chromatography separates amino acids based on their differences in polarity. First, the unknown amino acid samples are spotted onto a piece of paper. The paper is known as the stationary phase, as it doesn't move. The paper is then inserted into a chamber holding the solvent, which is known as the mobile phase. The solvent migrates up the paper as a result of capillary action. If the solvent is polar, for example, any polar amino acids will dissolve into it to be carried for a longer amount of time than any nonpolar amino acids. The more polar amino acids will be carried a farther distance than the less polar amino acids. In this way, the samples of amino acids get separated. Once the solvent has reached the top of the paper, the paper is taken out of the chamber and sprayed with ninhydrin, a chemical that makes the colorless amino acids appear purple. RF values are then calculated for each amino acid by dividing the distance traveled by the sample by the distance traveled by the solvent. You can then compare the RF values of the unknowns to RF values of known amino acids run at the same time to determine the identity of the unknown amino acids in the sample. Whereas thin layer chromatography takes advantage of amino acid polarity, ion exchange chromatography takes advantage of amino acid charge. The basis of ion exchange chromatography is that you have a column, as is shown on the left, filled with resin beads that are either negatively charged or positively charged. Amino acids will stick to the column for varying amounts of time depending on their charges. On the right, you can see an example of what the resin beads look like. Charged groups attached to the beads hold on to the amino acids to be separated. A very general overview is as follows. First, a column containing resin beads is prepared. A mixture of amino acids is run through the column. As the mixture runs through the column, fractions of given volumes are collected from the bottom of the column and analyzed. There are different types of resin beads that can be used depending on the types of amino acids you're trying to separate. A cation exchange column holds on to cations, allowing anions to pass through more quickly. Some examples of cation exchange resins appear here, and their structures are shown. Notice that they are negatively charged in order to attract the positively charged cations. 
An anion exchange column holds on to anions, allowing cations to pass through more quickly. Some samples of anion exchange resins appear here. Notice that these are positively charged in order to attract the negatively charged anions. Here is an example of an ion exchange column. In this case, because the resin beads are negatively charged, they will hold on to cations, making this a cation exchange column. The mixture of amino acids is poured onto the column and they will move through at rates determined by their net charges at the pH that is being used. Because the beads are negatively charged, they will repel the amino acids with the strongest negative charge and will hold on to the amino acids with the strongest positive charge. Therefore, anions with a big negative charge will elute first, followed by anions with a smaller negative charge, followed by cations with a smaller positive charge, followed by cations with a big positive charge. Let's take a closer look at how exactly the amino acids get knocked off the column. The first step is to select a column. In this case, the column is a cation exchange column with negatively charged resin beads. You'll notice that there are cations stuck to the resin beads. This is because you can't buy beads with empty anions hanging off of them. Step two is to get all amino acids to stick to the column. In order to do this, we need to make all the amino acids positive by lowering the pH below the pKs of all the functional groups so that they are all protonated. Step three is to start knocking the amino acids off of the column. This can be done in one of two ways. You can either increase the salt concentration or you can change the pH of the buffer that is being run through the column. The cation of the salt will compete with the positively charged amino acids for the negatively charged beads, causing those amino acids that have the strongest positive charge to stay on the column the longest. The other way to knock amino acids off the column is to increase the pH of the buffer at which point the functional groups on the amino acids will begin to deprotonate, making the amino acids less positively charged. Aspartate will elute first from the column. We can tell based on its PI value of 3.0 as opposed to serine's PI of 5.7 or lysine's PI of 9.8. Because aspartate has a much lower PI, at any pH above 3, it will be negatively charged. Serine will elute next, as it will be negatively charged at any pH above 5.7. And lysine will elute last, as it will be positively charged for the longest amount of time. As an ion exchange column runs, fractions of a set volume are collected as they elute off the column. Once the fractions are collected, they are analyzed and an elution profile is generated. Notice at the top of the elution profile how the pH and salt concentration of the buffers running through the column changes as the ion exchange column is run.